Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters for making this video possible, and we would also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description for more details. My name is Sava, and today we're going to investigate a major limitation in the repricing gap analysis for interest rate risk measurement in terms of the net interest income exposure. Well, you might have heard of the repricing gap analysis when you identify rate sensitive assets and liabilities, calculate the total sums of the two, and then you can calculate the repricing gap by subtracting the rate sensitive liabilities from rate sensitive assets. And then based on the magnitude of the gap and the direction of the gap, you can calculate the exposure of net interest income under various scenarios. Namely, what would happen to your net interest income when the interest rate changes by some amount in some direction. So for example, here we can see that our repricing gap, the conventionally measured repricing gap across consolidated rate sensitive assets and liabilities is zero, meaning that the bank is seemingly immunized net interest income wise against any interest rate movements in either direction. But is it really the case? Or is there something fishy about the assumptions of the repricing gap analysis that we can uncover? Obviously the latter. We can see that the repricing gap analysis assumes that the yield curve shifts, the changes in interest rates corresponding to different maturities are parallel. Meaning that if interest rates change, they change synchronously across all maturities. And here I have got a visualization of real world interest rate changes, namely illustrating how the yield curve shifted from year end 2019 until year end 2020. Here in blue, you can see how the yield curve looked like in 2019. And here in orange, you can see how the yield curve looked in 2020. Obviously, and it doesn't take a lot to notice it, the interest rates decreased a lot from 2019 over to 2020. And it can be explained by a number of reasons. First of all, the expectations of economic growth have been revised downward, obviously, because of the crisis the major economies are currently facing. Second, the more expansionary monetary policies of central banks that are aimed at combating the recessions are also contributing to the decrease of short-term interest rates in particular. But here we can see that the shift in the yield curve, the downward shift of the yield curve that we quite obviously observe, is not by any means parallel. It can be considered a little bit of a parallel shift if you go for shorter term maturities, up to three years in particular. But later on, we can see that the slope of the yield curve is much steeper in 2020 if you look at longer term maturities than it was the case in 2019. And that can be related to an increased liquidity risk premium for longer term lending, perhaps. This is one of the plausible explanations, uh, not necessarily the ultimately correct one. So here we need to acknowledge for the fact that the maturity structure of rate sensitive assets and liabilities and the non-parallel nature of yield curve shifts can generate net interest income exposures even if your rate sensitive assets is equal to your rate sensitive liabilities if there is no conventional repricing gap so how can we quantify it and how can we compare it to the scenarios with parallel yield curve shifts we'll do just that now in excel so here Returning to our baseline case with parallel yield curve shifts, we can actually model a yield curve shift of a certain number of percentage points. So let's assume that we try to model a yield curve shift one percentage point downwards and assume it's parallel. And by the way, it's not an uncommon and uh, overly academic assumption that yield curve shifts are parallel. Even if you look at uh, real-world disclosure at annual reports of systemically important financial institutions, you'll find that in the interest rate risk measurement sections, 
they do almost exclusively refer to modeling scenarios when yield curve shifts are parallel. So that's quite relevant for real-world financial practice as well. So here, as we model our one percentage point downward shift in the yield curve, we can actually calculate the new hypothetical yield curve and just add our shift, locking it over here in terms of the row and dragging it down, what would our yield curve look like if the shift was parallel? And we can see that, albeit it is similar for longer term maturities, the parallel shift predicts quite higher interest rates for shorter term maturities. And that's really relevant for net interest income exposure for our banks. Because, as we all know, our banks operate under a liquidity transformation, and that's why they have positive maturity gaps. They predominantly rely on shorter term liabilities to fund longer term assets. And that's how banks create liquidity and ultimately create consumer value. And that's why an unmatched decrease in shorter term interest rates can actually increase net interest incomes for banks. And that's what we will calculate and verify just now. If we were to assume that the yield curve shift was parallel, we obviously would have just multiplied our gap by our shift in percentage points and uh, determined that our exposure is zero. And uh, here we can also verify it by calculating our interest income and interest expense across all maturity bands and across all interest rates for the 2019 scenario and for the parallel yield curve shift scenario. So here for 2019, we can just use some product and multiply all of the rates over here onto risk sensitive assets across the maturity bands, the respective maturity bands over here. And here we can lock both rows and columns for the rates as we want to drag it to calculate expenses as well. And here we can just lock the rows as we want the columns to change when we will calculate the expenses. And here, as our interest rates are in percentage points, we can divide by 100 to still get our interest income in billion dollars. And we can see here that our interest income in 2019 is $5.56 billion. Our interest expenses, $5.01 billion. And it can actually tell us how banks can create their net interest income, how they can make a profit, even if their rate sensitive assets and liabilities are equal. As naturally, and it's true even for a crisis scenario like 31st of December 2020, as we can see over here, longer term interest rates are typically higher than shorter term interest rates. So if banks borrow short term and lend long term, they're not only undertaking the maturity transformation and creating value, but they also generate a hefty profit for themselves as they can now land at higher interest rates for longer terms and then compensate their short term borrowing and its lower cost as short term interest rates are lower. So even if we don't account for the lending margin uh, with banks lending out their funds at a higher rate on average, even accounting for the maturity transformation, we can actually see that even if that's not the case, you would have generally a positive net interest income just because of longer term lending and longer term interest rates being higher. And our net interest income is just the interest income minus the interest expense. We can see that our net interest income is roughly half a billion dollars, which is not bad. And if we try and calculate it for our hypothetical scenario when our interest rates just shift one percentage point downwards so we just drag this column across to our simulated case we can see that our income decreases quite a bit and if we see the amount of the decrease we can quite easily relate it to the size of our rate sensitive assets the magnitude the total value of 320 billion dollars meaning that a one percentage point shift downwards will cause the interest income to decrease $3.2 billion exactly. But the same would happen to our rate sensitive liabilities, isn't it? 
as there are also 320 billion dollars of those a one percentage point decrease in interest rates would offset the corresponding decrease in interest income meaning that our net interest income would stay exactly the same and we can verify it by just subtracting the interest rate by net interest income in the parallel yield curve shift scenario and we can verify it by subtracting the 2019 net interest income from the net interest income in the hypothetical parallel yield curve shift scenario getting exactly zero which matches perfectly the scenario we were talking about earlier on that assumes parallel yield curve shifts that relies on the conventional repricing gap analysis but what would happen in the real world scenario where the shift of the yield curve have been non-parallel quite predominantly especially for longer term maturities and would it be the case that as short-term rates decreased a lot and long-term rates decreased by not so much our net interest income exposure would actually be positive to verify it we can just copy this formula across and calculate interest income interest expense and net interest income for 2020 and we just need to drag this across to correspond to new 2020 interest rates across all maturity bands we can see that our interest income has decreased quite a lot all the more so than in the parallel shift scenario reducing to almost 1.5 billion dollars but our interest expense has plummeted all the more so to 0.5 billion dollars meaning that our net interest income has actually increased to over a billion dollars corresponding to compared to slightly above half a billion in 2019 and we can verify it by calculating the difference again between the 2020 scenario and the 2019 scenario and we can see that the real world exposure for a non-parallel yield curve shift is indeed positive and we can verify it for a large set of various scenarios for example if we consider that our long-term borrowing our long-term funding is greater than 28 uh, billion dollars this hypothetical figure if it increases for example to 56 we can see that first of all our uh, exposure for the parallel yield curve shift and for the repricing gap analysis is indeed the same it matches but our real exposure is all the more so higher than in the previous case scenario so it teaches us that as the maturity structure of rate sensitive essence liabilities is potentially relevant when yield curve shifts are not parallel our interest rate risk exposure and our net interest income exposure consequently depends on both our repricing gap and on the structure of our rate sensitive assets and liabilities and that's all there is for the limitations of repricing gap analysis and the relevance of the maturity structure of rate sensitive essence liabilities for interest rate risk calculations and net interest income exposures please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful in the comments below i'm eager to see any further suggestions for videos and business economics or finance you would like me to record and don't forget to subscribe to our channel consider supporting us on patreon thank you very much and stay tuned